All right, we're in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25 and 26. <clears throat> and we, Lord willing, are going to wrap this up. Um, with Cain and Abel, and then next time I share, we will get into Abraham <clears throat> and as it relates to the firstborn. Okay, this is uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, talking about Eve, for God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. All right, so <clears throat> we discussed this last time we met. <clears throat> Um, but I felt it good to uh, maybe take the time to go over what we what we shared um, to try to make sure that you understand what these scriptures are saying and what they're putting forth. Um, of course, it simply starts with the reality that the parents, Adam and Eve, were driven out of the garden because they failed God on that front. And they, <clears throat> we have no record of them having any contact with God from that time till Abel and Cain are offering sacrifices. And, um, Similar, you could say, to um, Abraham and uh, once he and Sarah had conspired to have uh, the firstborn through Hagar, God didn't speak to him for, what, 13 years? So um, there appears to be a period of time where the Lord did not speak to them. But now we have the story of Cain and Abel. And in Cain and Abel, we have, um, we have potential for the plan of God. We have two sons. And the hope is for a firstborn the progenitor, the firstborn to go forth and bring forth, but to also uh, be the representation of all that would come, that being the idea. That, of course, refers to Jesus. And he is the prototype, and that word is actually used, prototokos, uh, in Colossians, I think it is. He is the prototype, meaning, you know, if they're going to build a new car, they build a prototype. And they, from that, if they're satisfied with it, every other car is going to be made after that. Okay. And um, so they're, the Adam and Eve are looking for... Um, God's pleasure again, God's favor. But it appears to me, and may not to you, but it appears to me that their hope rested in one of their sons being the firstborn. In other words, favor, God's pleasure being related to the firstborn, not to just having children. Um, and I also assumed that <clears throat> they assumed that 
um, that Cain was going to be the firstborn, but Abel was the one who pleased God. Abel was the one who God spoke to favorably, and he spoke to him favorably in relationship to the altar. Okay. So the two points of favor that we're, we're discussing and that we've seen in this story are the, a f having a firstborn and that being in relationship to an altar. Okay? So they, uh, the, the, the boys, Cain and Abel, they offer their sacrifice. And as we've said, it seems to me that it is clear that Cain thought that he was, that God was going to really be pleased with what he offered. It seemed to me that he was so assured of himself and of his offering that his countenance fell when it didn't happen. Does that make sense? Okay. And so let's take it out of the, that story and put it into our, our story. Do we do things, do we relate to God through what we might call offerings or whatever? No, I'm not talking about putting money in a basket or something. And we are convinced that that's going to please God when in reality it may be devoid of two things or one of two things. It may be devoid of the true firstborn, just us assuming, assuming that the firstborn is in us because we got saved. Well, he is in us because we got saved. That's undeniable. But the firstborn the father is looking for isn't, you know, one that is hid under a bushel. but placed on a hill where it can give great light. Um, and we are that, that hill. We are God's Mount Calvary now. We are that from which that light, that death, that giving can shine forth um, not by our deeds, but by Christ in us, the hope of glory. Um, but it's so easy to assume that, well, anything we do that's kind or, you know, you know, uh, takes a little effort <laughs> or something, <laughs> it, that's, this has got to be the Lord, you know. Um, you know, you could, you know, you could say, well, um, I was going to stay home tonight because it was cold and windy and it might be rainy and it might be dangerous, but I decided I'm going to get up and I'm going to go for it. Well, that, while that could be the Lord, it could also be you or me, you know. Well, what will they think if I'm not there? Um, they might think it's cold and rainy and windy. <laughs> uh, and besides, <clears throat> we're not trying to gain favor of men. Paul talks about that in bunches of different places, and yet you tell me if I'm wrong. Most of the activity of the church has to do with, you know, looking good to everyone else so that people think you're spiritual because nobody wants to look like the, the, the town drunk. And I'm not talking about alcohol. I'm talking about looking bad to everyone. Well, I have many things to say to you about that. <laughs> but I am yet constrained of the Lord and have been these past three years. So I wait on him. Um, so, 
Cain is blindsided. All right. Being blindsided is tough. It is tough. Um, because if you think that you're right in tune with the Lord, and then, you know, and, you know, the Lord doesn't get a chance to blindside us much because we don't listen that much. We just keep on going. Uh, he blindsides us when it comes to the altar. The cross will blindside us. The cross will will weigh us. The cross will prove us. Um, the lamb will do that. And um, so Cain was, was apparently self-deceived because we have no record of it being Satan. Self-deceived as to his stature, as to his place, um, and for an example of that, we can go back to the beginning of all of this, and that was the prodigal son. And the elder son felt the same exact way, that I deserve this. This is due me. I should be honored. I have, you know, Cain says, I have, I have worked hard to give you on the altar this. The prodigal, I mean, the elder son in the prodigal son story can say, I have um, <clears throat> uh, stayed with you while your renegade son left, and I have supported you, and, and you have been ever before me. That's words spoken by David, who the Lord was ever before him, actually, and it wasn't, you know, as an elder son. Not even a semi-elder son, not David. He was way down the line. Um, which again tells us that God, our Father, the real God, not the religious God, the real God, put the firstborn in each and every one of us, and he did it because we could never measure up. So it's kind of like the sooner that we learn that we're not what he's looking for. I mean, because, you know, we go, well, you know, when we look at ourselves, sometimes we say, well, I'm, I'm just a bad person. Da, 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 da. But we compare ourselves with someone else. We go, well, I'm not that bad. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we, that's a mentality. That's an actual thing, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so it's like when I'm focused on my problems, I can go, oh, my God, I'm not worthy to be your son. Then look at someone else and go, they sure are not worthy to be your son. In fact, I'm more worthy than they are, you know. Um, the, how do I say this? Being the one who bears forth the firstborn to the father is not a, a, a race, it's not a, it's not a competition. It's not a competition. If there's a competition, let's join the competition to get lower and lower until death is assured. <laughs> let's see who can, who can get there first. Now, in truth, we all got there at the same time <laughs> because Jesus took us to death. But we don't all see it at the same time, do we? We all individually must so see that. And the goal of seeing that is not to become spiritual or to, to, to have great revelation. The goal of seeing that is so we can be dead. So that, why? So that Christ may be the firstborn unto the Father. Um, so, um, Abel, on the other hand, he had a sacrifice. In fact, it, it, it's actual plural in those verses where he just wanted to give lambs. You know, it's, this should be us. We should just want to give lambs to the Father. You know, but Christianity has molded us where doing 
ministry things for God in the church is, is giving that lamb. But the greater thing than serving or doing that would be with attitudes that were, you know, his nature and that would bear the, the blame or the whatever, the guilt when it wasn't yours and, and would do that in the right spirit and wouldn't have to think about that later and go, well, man, they're wrong. They shouldn't accuse me because it's always, it, I mean, I don't know how many times I can say this. It's always going to be that kind of a situation. It must be because the other thing tests your resolve and commitment to stay with the ministry or whatever, whatever you're doing. But this is testing the absolute litmus test if it's Christ the lamb in you and the firstborn or not. And that is reactions, reactions. You react. And sometimes you don't react at that moment. You know, anybody ever had something happen at church and you're driving home and boy, it just builds. Oh man, oh, they should, this is, that ain't right. No, I don't know. Um, the test, the litmus test is always, always, always gonna be What happens? How do we respond when stuff goes wrong? And, and we think that that has to do with um, sinners or whatever, but that has to do first and foremost with the ones that you're around the most. In some cases that's family, in other cases it's you guys. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, and that you know because that's where it starts. Anybody ever read the vision and calling of New Creation Fellowship? It starts in the family. That's the way I put it. I mean, it starts individually, but then, well, here was what I meant. I'm not saying that because I'm pro-family. I'm saying that strictly for one main reason. That's the closest place where you're going to be able to show Jesus. That's where it counts first, not most, but most at the moment. Don't, you know, well, I'm, I'm really good around, but see, Jesus said, you know, if you love those, you know, who love you, what good is that? Even the heathen do that. <clears throat> well, what does that say? If Jesus says it in those words, what does that say? He said, it, he's saying to love those that love you back and to have a hard time with those who don't, that you're a heathen. <laughs> I mean, think, think about it now. You know, I know I say wild outlandish things that can, after a while, you can go, oh, that's just Randy. But think about the way Jesus said that, and it, really is he saying if you're doing that i don't see jesus i don't see the lamb i don't see the firstborn i see a heathen based on what based on how how involved you've been or how you know much you give or i don't you know all the those things no jesus makes it based on just loving the ones that love you because that feels good. And this person, you know, says stuff or isn't right or da 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 da. And I can't love what's contrary to Jesus. No, what, what, here's what is Jesus dying on the cross, loving them and forgiving them. <laughs> but we, how can we look at that and go, that's contrary to Jesus? And then say, I believe in the Lamb of God. I believe in the cross. Because to believe in the Lamb of God and the cross is to say, I will lay down my life for you with every ounce of strength that I would do for someone I love. I, 
I'm not saying I'm fully there. You know what, though? I at least know what the mark is. <laughs> you know, and I'm pressing toward it. So, you know, we, <clears throat> years ago I went through a search, and I never shared that one either, but I went through the New Testament and just started marking every time it related to something, how we treated somebody. It blew my mind. Most of the things have to do with that. And, you know, and of course I'm going, well, after a while I went, well, of course it would, because all he's after is the son, the firstborn, the lamb in us. And so this is where the victory is won. This is where the demonstration is made. This is the manifestation of the sons of God that it talks about in Romans 8. And the whole world's groaning. So he says, you know, but it's all going to work together for those who love God. I love God. Those are the call, called according to the purpose, and that purpose is that we be conformed to the image of his son. Well, who's his son? His firstborn son. Let my first, my son, my firstborn son go to me in sacrifice, the father would say. All right, so that defines, if, you, if you'll let me say it like this, that defines Christianity in a completely different manner. That, that, I mean, so much of the stuff that we do wasn't preeminent in the first church after Jesus rose from the dead. You know, you don't hear a lot about big worship services and stuff. You don't have, you know, I mean, there were offerings taken, but the, really the, the only offerings that I think I remember were for Jerusalem who was in famine and they were hurting. And Paul was the one who started that stuff based on the, the spirit of the, of the lamb. That's what he based it on. And they didn't treat him very well. <laughs> a lot of them looked down on him, thought he was a renegade, and thought what he was teaching was out of whack um, with what the apostles were teaching. Did you know that? Out of whack with what the apostles were teaching. Well, he ended up having to instruct the apostles, you know, some of them, um, in the way of the land. Well, we can't eat with these Gentiles. Well, for God's sake, they're the same deal. The, we're not supposed to love them. We're supposed to love ourselves. We love ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely, for sure. So, so, Abel comes to the altar and he brings lambs. See, there's only one lamb, but you get to bring him all the time. You see what I'm saying? So it's, he's offering the same lamb, but different. Here's this one. Now here's this. Now here's this. And this is us. Okay, here's me over in this situation. I offer that lamb and over in this situation. You can do that all day long. You can just offer lambs all day long. You say, well, um, it's not easy. What? What did you say? It's not easy. This is who we are. It's Christ in us. We shouldn't be saying it's Christ in us if it's not Christ in us. I mean, you know, and I, that's not, see, that's not blame like from me to you or you to someone else. That's us being together in this and saying we want Jesus in this way and we're going to press together and we're going to get the Lord and we're going to hold on to one another. So I'm not trying to divide up. I'm just trying to say this is it. This is who we are now. If we're born again, that's who we got on the inside of us. And Abel is going, okay, here we go. Want another lamb, Father? Yep, okay, I got one. See, we go, well, I, I gave two lambs today. 
<laughs> you know, I'm, I've been good. We, somebody ought to acknowledge that. You know. <laughs> and the father's going, I just, could you just give me one more lamb today? I, I don't think I can. I mean, they have pushed me to my limit. I'm out of lambs. It's, it is sad. It's sad because it's real, we're talking real life here. I mean, see, we have to hear stuff like this, and we have to go, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, here's what we shouldn't do. I hear this. I'm convicted. I really know that there's some truth in it, and the Holy Spirit seems to be bearing witness, um, and so I want to change. But then we never pursue it beyond that feeling at the moment, you know, and I'm talking for all of us. Um, but what that should do is instead of moving us away from the Lord, feeling estranged, we should come running to him because he wants us. And he, he wants to be the lamb in us and he, he would love that, <laughs> you know. Oh, look, you're the bride of the lamb. You're the wife of the lamb. How beautiful is that when that happens to him? I mean, we may think it's beautiful when we see it in someone else or ourselves, but we cannot imagine how beautiful that is first to the father to get his firstborn. And second, in the same breath and movement and reality, the firstborn has his wife. See, the whole deal is, I mean, you all know that my, my main preaching over the years, if I've had to address anything with husband and wife, is I've always focused down on the husband. Is that right or not? Have you all kind of noticed that? The reason why I do that is because he's the head. He's the head. He's responsible. Okay. But there is the other side, and that is Jesus is looking for a wife, a lamb wife. And that could be you. Female lamb is a you. That could be you. It should be you. Not for your husband or whatever, but for your husband. You're for Jesus. Is he worth it? Well, you know, it, it goes against my grain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well... Okay, I understand that because it goes against all of our grain until Christ is formed in us. But, but instead of saying, because it, you know, it is, you know, the old um, the salmon festival, I wasn't even there for it, but the old, I know s salmon, and, and uh, they swim upstream against the stream to go to where they were born to, to lay eggs for the next generation. And... Um, you know, I have seen sh those streams, and I've seen them going up that, going in. You see them doing all this stuff. You see bears standing there waiting when they jump and catching them and all this kind of stuff. But every once in a while, you'll see one going downstream because it's dead. Yeah. Okay? Because it's dead. So, you know, my heart wants to turn from, from my, my realizations about me to his realizations about who I am in his eyes and in his heart. My realization about me is, okay, I'm pitiful or I'm a mess or I'm all this kind of stuff, which no, nobody denies that. I mean, you know, we all agree with you. But, but... But the, the fact is that does not matter in light of the cross and in light of his heart. It doesn't matter. 
you don't change instantly, but at a certain juncture, you do say, you know what, I am sick of me. You know, I wrote a poem called that. Sick of me. And you drive a stake in the ground and you say, that's it, I am pressing, I'm turning to, you know, I'm gonna head upstream, okay. Well, immediately you're gonna be confronted with, um, what's the right word? The, the, you know, I was trying to say friction, but it's the, the resistance. It, and immediately you feel that, but you don't go, well, this couldn't be the Lord then. When Paul said, you know, I've used this example recently, but when Paul said, I press towards the mark, anytime you press towards a wall or something, you feel resistance. But even if that wall doesn't move, it's building something in you. You understand the wall may not fall down the first time you push on it, but you're, you understand the process and it will build Christ in me and, and a resolve and a resolve, a resolve. I, you know what? I, I can, you know, it's like I, I can fool the rest of these salmon. I can get halfway up there and then just let go. You know? uh, but you have to resolve, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to quit. I want the Lord, and I want the Lord in this way. Amen. And I want, I want him pleased, this, that it might be to his good pleasure. Yes. We read that, but we don't know what that means. We go, well, this is all for his good pleasure. What is? I mean, point at something. Well, he likes steeples on churches. Yeah, that's right. Or he likes, you know, you know, he likes this or that, which is usually some sort of religious thing that we're either doing or whatever. Um, that's where we have to find his heart. I mean, if, if there was something you, a person you really, really liked, and, you know, it was normal to get them a present on their birthday or Christmas or something, and you really, really liked them, and you really had the wherewithal to do it, you would go get something that you know that they would just really, I mean, it would just, oh, my God, you know, a puppy, just like, you know. <laughs> um, and the main reason why you would do it is just to see how they respond. <laughs> it's like, you know, I mean, I remember... Rocky, when he was a little puppy, and I remember Reggie and Bethany, you know, and they were so doggone cute. And you just hold them, and they would just melt into you. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do all of this. They had Rocky in them, you know what I mean, those puppies. They wouldn't do all this. I got to get down, and they just lay over on you. you. We got pictures of it. Remember that? They just lay on you and stuff like that. And you just smile. You just smile. You know, well, there's something that the Lord wants, and if we never find out what it is, then those scriptures are going to be fulfilled by somebody else, but we'll just say, well, his good pleasures, we got saved, and that we've been happily going about, you know, church entity. All right. So. Um, when and I'm just looking at the scripture now because I'm winging this again uh, Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth called his name Seth for for God said she hath appointed me another seed in the stead of Abel. All right, so that was part of what we discussed, and I guess I should do this if I'm going to go back to the board. All right, so on the board at the top, I have firstborn, and underneath it to the, well, your left, is the word death with an arrow going in between it all the way to the other side, and it says resurrection. And what we want to see is the death and resurrection in this story. And what we want to see is 
the death and resurrection of Christ as understood by the New Testament. And what we want to see is that that pattern can be seen a lot of places. A lot of places. All right. So we start with Abel because we know that the death... The death happened with Abel in our story. And in our story, God acknowledged him, just like the prodigal son gave him the signet ring, gave him all the things that said, you are now in charge, and then said to the elder son, child, immature one. This is, folks, this is Galatians 4. I mean, we're all waiting for the, the, the son to come forth crying, Abba, Father, not for the son to come forth so that we're seen as super spiritual. Let them have their relationship through you. Stop thinking it's you and stop carrying yourself in such a way that people will go, oh, you're, you really know the Lord or you're really spiritual or whatever. All right. So, because we, we can hunt down people that we can impress. And, I mean, we just need to quit doing it. <laughs> we just need to quit doing it. We need to hunt down people with which we can fellowship in the real sun and that can challenge us and you can challenge them. But, you know, I mean... You know, one of the things is that we're, we're, we wouldn't want to say something to somebody. We wouldn't want to speak the truth in love, which means I love you, so I'm going to tell you. Actually, that's not right, or let's look at the scriptures, or, you know what I mean? You don't, you're not condemning. You're not accusing. That's not the right spirit. But one thing you're not doing is just going, okay, yeah. Whatever you say, oh, that's wonderful. Praise God. You know, if you and hear something, bless them, love them, and say, well, look at this, and maybe, you know, just take it to the Lord. But what do you think about this? But w I wouldn't want to say anything because I really need my little club. <laughs> you know, I really need my little club to be on my side through thick and thin, so I need to be on their side through thick and thin. You know, being on your side, okay, this is going to be hard to believe, but I'm on your side. <laughs> and all the stuff that I say, I'm on your side for you to get the Lord. And I know that it doesn't always sound fun, but it, hopefully it all sounds like maybe it is from him. And it's not me talking to you, but the Lord is saying, hey, let's, come on, let's pick it up. Let's get up. Let's Let's move, you know, like, like, remember, do you remember Moses? Stand still and see the salvation of God. You remember that? And God speaks to him and says, don't stand still, move forward. I've already shown you the salvation. The lamb has already been slain. You ate it. Now let's go forward. He rebuked, stand still and see. Do y'all remember that? Well, I'm rebuking it now. <laughs> I'm rebuking it. I'm saying, the Lord is saying, come on, let's go. This is not about condemnation. This is, a, this is about his heart. And I think it's worth it. So anyway, so that's, there's the death. But what the scripture basically is saying, that the resurrection is Seth. All right? But let's understand what that means and not misread that according to theological concepts. Let's just see it the way the Father sees it. The Father sees it that Abel, like um, Stephen, was full of the Lord and, and was was lamb-centered and had so much potential for the new world, right? 
so much potential for the new world. And we look at that and we see that person, or maybe we think we maybe we think we're that person or whatever, but we, we see that and we go, you know, like in Stephen's case, he shouldn't have died. He would have brought so much. I mean, look at all the things that he was doing before this moment. You know, why didn't you just keep your mouth shut and they wouldn't have stoned you? <clears throat> yeah. And probably Saul wouldn't have become Paul either. Because it takes a death. And it takes a life in death to get a life. Okay. So, Abel, he looks great. But God sees one thing. What he's offering is a lamb. And he's offering it as a lamb. And I believe that he's got the spirit that I want of the firstborn. So he acknowledges him and he's, he says this, I accept your offerings and I accept you. Because the, the New Testament says not just his offering, but accepted Abel. Because, okay, offering is a manifestation of the being. If our being is not in order... then our offering stinks. You understand when I say in order, what am I talking about? The true nature of Christ. You know, him. Okay, so, um, so God sees that, and, you know, did God, does God have foreknowledge? Yeah, so he probably foreknew what was going on in Abel, I mean in Cain, right? And he probably knew that that was going on in him toward Abel, his dear son. That's another term for the firstborn, his dear son. So here we go again. You see it, Nestor. You see it all. Why didn't God intervene? Why did, why did God allow the king to bless Haman and give him high position and all this stuff. Why did God allow those people to stone Stephen? Why did it, the why is every time there because we don't understand the Father's heart and the way of the Lord. We understand the way of Cain, but we don't understand the way of the Lord. Okay? And, and that's it. We go, why? Why would this happen? Why? You know, and not just why, why would God allow it? God is strong and he's mighty and he's got all power and he made everything and this is getting out of hand. No, it's not. Why did this happen to Joseph? He was the youngest. He was, we, it's just, you just keep going. And we keep doing this and at some juncture we have to have the first thing that comes to mind is the pattern which is Christ crucified and we go I know why because this is the way God operates because this is how he's going to bring forth life so he dies and life comes forth and it's Seth but it is in, in the stead of him, it is not instead of him in the sense of not able, but instead Seth. It is he's standing in the stead of Abel. And, and he's standing in that in resurrection form. Their one son, Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen. So this, so if we just said Jesus here, this is Christ crucified. If we said Jesus over here with Seth, we're talking about God exalting, get ready, the dead son. That's good, isn't it? It is good. That's, see, God will always exalt the dead son if he's given in that spirit. He will always, and it will not just be a resurrection, meaning, because, see, it, think, of the, think of the phrase, just think of it. Uh, uh, when there's a resurrection, you, who do you resurrect? The dead. Okay. You're, 
you're raising the dead. So that's so when you look on the on the throne, you see a slaughtered lamb. Well, you know this. We've been over this. We see a slaughtered lamb, but I'm always trying to get us to really see it to such a degree that we'll see it in all this stuff and not just in one story, the story of Christ being put to death and raised. That this is his pattern. This is the way he thinks. This is the way he accomplishes stuff. This is the way he accomplishes stuff. This is the way he brings forth life to other generations. Okay, and the proof of that is what in this story? The proof of that is Abel goes into death. So God, said she, <laughs> hath given me, okay, and here, so here comes the raised lamb, the raised crucified, and there's right now, there's Cain and all of his descendants. We read about them. Y'all remember that? All those guys? Um, and so they're all, you know, the world is getting, starting to fill up a little bit. I mean, it's very small, but it's a, more people than it was with two. And so one of the most pure ones dies. What a loss. What a loss to the world, you know. Watchman Nee died in prison 20 years and never. What a loss. Oh, really? Oh, really? You know. See? We just mourn over death. We just go, you know, this is, this is a loss, you know. I mean, if I died, some people go, this is not a loss. This is good. <laughs> but some would say this is a loss. But it's not going to be a loss because I'm not going to just die. I'm going to be, give, be given by the nature of Christ within me. So we look at this stuff and we can't handle it or we can't, you know, because here, here's this loss and then, oh, well, Seth isn't going to do. Well, Seth is him in resurrection and in exaltation. And so when you look at that lamb on the throne, you see a slaughtered lamb. You do not see Victory unless you understand victory as the lamb is going to spread now. Pomegranate sun. Y'all remember that? Me sharing on that? Full of seeds in the resurrection. The seed fell into the ground. Abel, the pomegranate sun came up. Seth, so you got all of Cain's descendants and all that kind of stuff, Right? Well, little did we know that God was going to send a flood and wipe it all out. But this guy was going to continue. Enos, his son, was going to come forth. And then would people begin to worship the Lord again, follow the Lord. That's what Scripture says right here. This, through this process, not just these chosen. He continued the great, no, 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 through this process. And they entered into it, death and resurrection. And so God wipes it all out, but he keeps Seth and Enos and all that. I mean, they're, they're continuing on that line. And then Noah has three sons, and Shem sends forth. And now he's still going forth, okay, in spirit, in spirit. We're talking about that. So everything else is wiped away. And that's God's pattern. That will always be his pattern. You, you remember, um, well, let me take a drink here. I tried to slurp, so if they're just listening to the audio, they knew I took a drink. Do you remember the story of David and Bathsheba? Remember that? Well, a lot of people have never really seen the true meaning behind that. But David and Bathsheba, 
Um, he was already married and had several different wives and stuff like that, but he saw her, and you know the story of Bathsheba. She's the one who took the bath. <laughs> and um, um, so, you know, she got pregnant, and, you know, we had to get rid of Uriah and all that kind of stuff. And so he was put to death, and so Nathan comes in to the king and says, tells the story, well, this guy just had one little bit and this and that and da 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 and then David says, we need to get that guy, you know. And Jesus says, this is marvelous in our eyes. Anyway, um, <laughs> you have to see, you have to start seeing this stuff. Anyway, so, um, so Nathan exposes him as that. Well, okay, so the baby, time comes for the baby to come forth. And the baby comes forth and dies. It's the dead son. It's the dead son. It's the son who died for the sins of Bathsheba and David. It is. <laughs> God took him. And so there was that that giving of that son. But then, and see, that's where I believe Solomon comes up because he was a son also, but he was a resurrection son for sure. But he's not, but the son that went into death isn't David. It's that baby, that unnamed. Why unnamed? Perfect. Perfect. And that son, and David gives it. He weeps and t you know while it's still alive and Lord, if you want it, da 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 da, and then when it dies, he goes, okay. And people are going, why are you not crying anymore? Why are you, why are you okay? And he gave, he gave the, he accepted and acknowledged the death in the Lord and the firstborn, because that was the firstborn. Certainly in that sense. So he does. He gives it. And then Solomon, resurrection and all the things that we think that, you know, the kingdom is about. This pattern is over and over. And we will read over it and we'll see what every other Christian sees in those stories and in those scriptures if we don't say my God, I am a foreigner. I am a, I think like a foreigner. I'm like a heathen. I do the things that heathen do because Jesus, you said that I do. And I, and I am, I am not worthy to be called your son. And let it break you down so that it can build you up in Christ. You know? And, and can I just say this to everybody? And don't run to everybody's rescue. That's right. If the Spirit of God is moving to break people down, you know, I mean, I know for a fact that there have been people, I've known this for years, but all the way up to, you know, even fairly recently, that there are people weeping because they want the Lord and everything. And they just, their heart is breaking to, to, to conform more to Christ. And... People will come over to them and pray for them and say, oh, Lord, just help them and comfort them and whatever they're going through, meaning, you know, it's like a crisis or something. And da-da-da-da. Do you know how foreign that sounds to the ears of someone who is breaking before the Lord? And do you know that they don't want to hear? I'm the, uh, I, I hope I can speak for that category. I know that's how I feel. Do you know the... One thing they don't want to hear is, well, compassionate ministry. One thing they don't want is, it's going to be okay. No, I don't want it to be okay. Amen. I want the Lord. Amen. 
pray harder that he'll just smash me, that he'll do whatever he's got to do, that I stay on track, I, I stray, I, if nothing happens and it's going slower and not really da da da, -da I stray. Tell him to bring in the heavy armor and let's do it. I, I need the Lord. I want the Lord. And I this sounds terrible. Please go away. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about because I can hear the amens. Hmm. The people came to comfort David. And they were shocked. They were shocked. David, this is where you mourn. <laughs> this is the place you mourn. Not while he's alive. While he's dead. No. The death is assured. God has spoken. This is not going to be a healing. This is going to be a resurrection. And I'm with him yes. in that. Yes. And he never looked back. He never looked back. And I, I would even go so far based on, most of y'all probably have never heard what I've shared on Bathsheba and everything, but she was the only one called a, a lamb, a, a woman in the Bible that was called a lamb. And if you study it out, you see that Bathsheba was never anywhere in the Bible accused as if she did the wrong. And there's much more to it. And there's this and there's this. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, it builds a complete case that is the exact opposite of what we've all thought and what we've been taught by people. And you see God, so I think that David and her got together and said, well, we'll, We'll give this son then. If it doesn't live, then let's be together in this and let's give the son. Amen. Let's give the dead son. Amen. Let's give him the dead son. Do you, do you have any idea what faith does? It's like a chemical. It, it ignites that situation <laughs> and brings forth for all generations through the flood and all, and it just keeps going. So, um, so I'm going to quit. But I just, I just, um, Kelly asked for a ride coming here, and so I, we gave it to her, and she said, so are you going to start sharing on Abraham now? And I said, no, I think I got one more because I knew I needed to come back. I needed to pour this out. I needed us, because I know your hearts and I know your ears. You want the Lord. And I, I knew that it would unite us. And it would move our hearts toward the dead son Amen. instead of just trying to find the resurrected one. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we just ask you in the name of your son, the, the, the dead son that you exalted, that you will quicken him in us that even unto death, that he was obedient even unto death, that we would be obedient unto the death that he died when he put us to death, that we'd be obedient unto that, and that we would also be obedient unto him giving himself unto death in us, uh, not trying to lift himself up, not trying to be something, not trying to, to, to find something in this earth, but to please your heart, Father, with your son, on a regular basis, your firstborn son. We want to let him go to you. We, and we know if we really let him go, he'll still be inside of us. But in our hearts, he will run to you if we let him go. But, Father, we keep him held in us and holding on to him and not wanting him to go unto sacrifice. We, all we see is the altar and the death there, and we don't see your your heart, Father, that he's going to come to you. He's running to you, and yes, he'll pass through that altar, but ultimately he's, his goal is you. So, Father, let us hear what the Spirit saith to the church. 
not what we think he says or what we would hope that he says, but may we readjust our dial so that we could find if there's a, another station you want us to listen to. Your heart, your desire, your need. We ask it in Jesus' name.